Hey everybody, Jacob Scott, Lowrance Product Expert. Thanks for joining us again. We're out here on the water. We're doing another webinar for you guys. Uh, we know everybody's still kind of sticking around the house, but you've got the ability to get into great outdoors. So don't forget when you get out there with your families, take those kids fishing, take your friends fishing. Hashtag Anglers Unite. Post that on our Facebook page. You know, we just love everybody having the opportunity to get in great outdoors and we like to see those fishing pictures screenshots the cool things you find on the water we're all about that uh, so this week we're going to continue on what we started originally a um, couple weeks ago or last month we did basic sonar interpretation we had a lot of people talking about how they enjoyed it how they learned a lot of things by it but one of the things people talked about is i'm not always seeing sonar pictures like what you guys were seeing how do I get to be able to see those? So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, it involves a lot of things, transducer placement, transducer type. So there's a myriad of things that we're going to cover on that subject. So first off, let's uh, go ahead and start talking about um, the difference between our transducers and the frequencies and the cone angles and everything else that that provides. Uh, most people, whether you're using a bass boat or a walleye boat, you guys are using either a glassed-in transducer or a skimmer transducer off of the transom of the boat. And typically, that's going to be one of our 83-200 transducers. So it does 83 or medium chirp or 200 and high chirp. So that's the frequency those transducers do. And your medium has a cone angle of about 35 degrees. So it gives you a nice, really wide cone angle. So you cover a lot of ground underneath the boat. And then your 200 has a cone angle that's about 20 degrees. So again, it's a pretty decent sized cone angle. It's not as wide as that 83, but that higher frequency gives you a little bit better imagery and things like that. Uh, a lot of freshwater guys, that's kind of what they're going to use. Um, then we talk about our medium frequency, uh, or well, let's talk about the 5200 first. The 5200, that one's often used by our guys that are in deep water. We're talking guys that are offshore, guys that are, you know, on the Great Lakes. So those guys that hit those bodies of water that just have really, really deep, you know, sections that are over 200 feet deep and they're going to be fishing in those areas. So that's the kind of transducers those guys are going to want to use is that 5200. And that 50 cone angle is about a 40 degree cone angle. It's a really low frequency cone angle, so it gets down there really deep. And then the 200 on that transducer has about a 12 degree cone angle. So it's not quite as wide as it is on the 83 200. It's a little more narrow, a little more focused, but that helps you find those fish that are, you're looking for specifically in targeting in the water columns and things like that. So um, those are just a couple things about that. So the one thing we really need you to do though is match your transducer to your fishing application. So when we talk about that, you know, we talk about the freshwater guys. A lot of those guys are not ever gonna be fishing in water, you know, that's over two or 300 feet deep. There are exceptions. There are bodies of water that have greater depths than that in it. But those guys typically, freshwater bass fishermen, things like that, aren't targeting those super, super deep depths. Then, you know, the medium chirp, like the TM-150, you know, that medium frequency transducer type person, you know, those are a lot of our walleye guys, you know, kind of a northern market guy, Great Lakes guy, where they're in deeper water, but they're targeting a different species. They're looking to get that depth and range out there so that they can get down there and see that sort of stuff. And then the deep water guys, our offshore guys, our Great Lakes guys, you know, they're going to use the 5200s, those low chirp frequency transducers, things like that to allow them to get really down deep, deep, deep into the water. So um, after that, the important thing, we say this time and time again, you know, people call customer service, people talk to their friends, people call us, they talk to us at shows and events that we're at. They're like, you know, I get pretty good images, but... You know, sometimes I, I start moving along and I reach a certain speed and I lose depth, I lose a bottom lock or something like that. And nine times out of 10, what we found out is it's transducer placement. Once we get them to be able to get us a picture of it or we actually have the boat where we can get in there and look at it. 
So um, the guys in bass boats, they typically have a glassed in transducer. Uh, that's usually placed at the factory or at their dealer. So those guys know pretty much where those need to be in the hull of the boat so they're, they're not over a strake or a stringer and they don't have a big piece of wood or something like that in their way. Uh, we do see when some of the guys put their transducers in the hole like that themselves. Sometimes they will wind up putting it over a stringer or something like that. And then they have to break that epoxy free and move those transducers. Uh, we got a picture that we took earlier. We hung some transducers off the back of this boat. We added some extra transducers just kind of so you can get a picture of what a good install looks like versus a bad install. Now you see that transducer on the left hand side of the screen. That transducer's set pretty much perfectly for the boat. It's gonna give me a nice read at speed. We've been out here doing some tests with it. I get a good picture. You can see it's first, about the midline of that transducer is even with the bottom of the transom. Then on the right hand side, you'll see that transducer's hanging really low in the water. This is what we see a lot of times with people when they see issues and they think, I'm getting a bad reading, I need to get my transducer lower in the water. Well, they don't actually need to get it lower in the water. As you can see, when you get that transducer lower in the water like that, that's going to create turbulence and an air bubble that's going to pop up around the transducer. And that's like one of the big reasons why people lose bottom at speed, because you've got that turbulence, it creates a nice big air bubble on the face of that transducer. And so then once you get that air bubble covering the transducer, it's going to not read bottom because it's seeing that air bubble instead of bottom. So uh, one thing I've done to help you guys kind of understand this a little bit more when we talk about transducer placement is I've taken some transducers. Here's one of our HDI transducers. You can see when we talk about about the midline of the transducer right here. So what you see in the blue is essentially that's the amount you want beneath the bottom of your boat. That's what you want sitting beneath the transom. As you can see, it's not a large slice. So again, when you're hanging down, transom's gonna be right about here. This is a 3D transducer, structure scan 3D, but it's also a very good example, um, essentially of how a structure scan type transducer should be. Now, as you see, if you're looking at this and you're looking at that level, you can see there's just a really, really thin slice of this that should be beneath the bottom of your hull if you're putting it down that far. Now, I know a lot of guys like to have these up in the air. Um, they put them up on jack plates and things like that so that they get them up out of the way so they don't, you know, bass fishermen, they like to get in there and fish in flooded timber and stuff like that. So those guys usually try to put these up a little bit higher so they have less chance of, of hitting these and, and breaking them off um, on stumps and things like that that they uh, run into out there. Another thing I've done is I've kind of created some transoms for you right here. As you can see, this is an example of a flat transom on the back of a boat. You'll find something like this on a bass boat and some aluminum boats and stuff like that. You'll have a nice kind of flat level service. As you can see, this is our 83200 transducer. So this does 83 and 200. It doesn't do any down scan or anything like that. But again, as you can see, we talk about the midline of the transducer. And this transducer, it's really easy to find that midline on because if you look right here, you can see there's actually a separation between the two halves. So that makes it real easy to find the midline. But as you can see, if we look at this, it's just barely below the neat bottom side of that transom plate. So that's how you want this in the water. Because what's gonna happen is that water is gonna come off of here and it's gonna be a nice clean flow right into the bottom of this transducer. It's not gonna shoot up on it and create an air bubble or anything like that. So. Then I've created this transducer, this transom plate here. This basically kind of shows what a 12 degree, you know, a lot of your like walleye boats, um, you know, those type of bottoms. You'll see it, they've got a, about a 12 degree angle on them like this. This is an active imaging transducer. Again, we've taken this transducer, kind of showing you how much should be sitting beneath the bottom of that transom to be able to get this to read on plane. Again, you're going to get nice clean water flow over that. 
It's not going to be too down deep into the water. It's not going to create that air bubble on the front of the transducer. So you'll get nice clean flow over this and you should maintain a nice bottom lock with an install like this. As we were talking about, as you can see, maybe you can see it better from this angle, I'm not sure. It's just a very slight little bit of this transducer beneath the bottom of that transom plate. So um, I keep talking about this air bubble. So a couple years ago, we went out on the water. We made a video. We put underwater cameras on the boat. We had a transducer on the boat. We had a total scan on it back then. Um, but the theory is the same for your total scan, for your structure scan, for your structure scan 3D, any transducer that you're going to place right there at that bottom level of the boat. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at this video. All right. So as we look at it, you can see the water flowing over the transducer here. You can see that we should... Uh, this is going to be our bad shot right here. You can see at the front of that transducer, you can see that air bubble start to form. And the faster we go, the bigger that air bubble is going to be, and it's going to cover up more and more of that transducer. And as it covers that transducer, that air bubble is what causes us to lose it. Now here, if you see them side by side, you can see the good video. You can see how that clean water is running over the face of that transducer. And again, you can see how that air bubble just creates and, and builds up on the front of the uh, transducer that's sitting too low into the water. So again, people think we talk about it a lot, but the important thing is, is to have it like that, just a little bit underneath the water. Again, the further it is, the more turbulence it creates, the faster you go. That's why guys talk about, you know, I can, at idle speeds, it looks really good. I don't have any problems. As I get going a little bit faster, it starts to kind of get a little grainy on me. And then once I reach a certain speed, I just totally lose it. And that's because once they reach that certain speed, that turbulence is built up and that air bubble just kind of pops over the bottom of that transducer and they lose their sonar signal. So let's look at this. If we, we're going to talk about things like the modes and this is your setup. The important things that you look at on this when you put your transducers on, if you hit settings and then you go to sonar, in your installation, you have a transducer type. Now with a lot of our newer transducers, they actually read what type of transducer is plugged in it because the ID is already in the transducer, so it fills in that information. So a lot of guys that have the glassed-in transducers in bass boats and things like that, it's going to say a PDRT or a PDT or a PD. Basically, that just stands for a puck transducer. And the T means it's got temperature, and the RT means it has a remote temp, which is a little cable with a brass fitting that comes out the back of the boat. You put it on the boat in the water so you get accurate water temperature. So these are what you kind of want to look at. By telling the unit what transducer you're using, it also knows how much power that transducer is capable of. So it'll know if it's a 500 watt, 600 watt, you know, 1000 watt transducer it knows what it can send to it. So you can see we have our HDI transducers listed here. We have quite a few Airmar transducers for you to select from if you choose an Airmar transducer. But most of the time your Airmar transducers are already going to auto ID so you don't have to worry about that. And you can see as we go through here, you know, we give you some options for like a generic high, medium and low chirp. So you have all that ability. So that's the first important thing you need to do is select your transducer for the unit. The main thing it does is the unit knows what type of transducer it is. It knows how much power it can send to it. So that's really, really important. Then after that, let's talk about our modes, the shallow, the general, fresh, all of these. You know, guys are always asking, what mode should I use? You know. Why do I want to use these different modes? And, and it's quite simple. 
if you've ever been out there on the water, people who use trolling motors see this a lot. If they pull their trolling motor out of the water, they throw it down on the cradle, they don't turn their unit off, they don't pause their sonar, anything like that. They take off across the lake to get to the next spot they want to fish. They jump up there, they throw the transducer, or throw the trolling motor in the water, transducer goes in the water. They look at their screen and their screen says a thousand feet. That's because the transducer's been out of the water and while it's not been able to maintain a bottom lock, it keeps searching further and further and further away. So the settings basically tell the unit, all right, if I'm in general mode, like you see right here, general mode is for basically a thousand feet and less. Shallow water mode, which is what probably 80% of the guys are gonna use that especially fish fresh type waters, you know, bass fishing, um, that sort of stuff. Shallow is for around 60 feet or less. So it provides that information. So when you pull that transducer out of the water and it goes to searching for it, it's not gonna get out there and search super, super, super far. It gives it a point to start from. Then the next thing we're gonna look at is freshwater. So the freshwater guys, especially walleye people, the anglers up north that are fishing for walleye, trolling for walleye, they use the freshwater setting um, for around 400 feet or less. So again, that's just kind of a range on these. Um, it's not cut and dry. It's just a suggestion. And it tells the unit, you know, if, if you're fishing a body of water that is, you know, 500 feet, 300 feet, something like that, that search range with the unit knowing I only need to go about this deep and I should find bottom at this deep max makes it a lot easier to get that bottom lock when you get back on the trolling motor. After that's your deep water, which obviously this is your offshore people. This is the guys out there, you know, chasing tuna, snapper, stuff like that. The guys that get in the really, really deep water. So your deep water setting is for around 5,000 feet. So if you're out there fishing those deep waters, that's the setting you want. That's, again, we talk about it, it's the people that are fishing coastal, offshore. That's where you wanna use that deep water setting. That's where you're gonna use that 5,200 transducer. Those are really nice ranges in there to use that. It just makes everything set up nicely. And then you have your slow troll, your fast troll, the clear water, and your ice settings. Now again, your trolling speeds, the transducer for that, it, um, the depths on those are around your 400 foot range. And just telling it the type of trolling you're doing so that it knows, all right, while well, I'm using this transducer in this fashion, it's a constantly moving, you know, kind of lets it know I want to be in a good search mode on this. Uh, the guys for the ice transducer, those guys are always sitting on the cold water. So the ice transducer, basically that just tells it, you know, we're going to be using this as a stationary transducer. We're pinging this one spot. So its main function is sitting there looking to fish, swimming by those ice holes, trying to catch those. So uh, Luke, do we have any questions on that so far? No problem. So let's start talking about some of the advanced features in the menus. If we look at advanced, that's where we see the noise rejection, your surface clarity, uh, your scroll speed, and your ping speed. So what do we use these for? Your noise rejection, basically, it helps filter out any external noise from the boat. That's things like, hang on guys, let me turn this off so I don't always lose my menu. If anybody likes to hide their menus, you can see we had the menu here, it kept going away. If you hit pages, settings, advanced, and then your user interface, right here your auto hide menus, if you turn that on, that menu will go away after 15 seconds. 
and I just turn that off so that I don't have to keep opening it back up. So your noise rejection. We have basically four options to use here. That's going to be off, low, medium, and high. So the noise rejection, we built this into the unit. This gives you the ability to help filter out any external noises that the transducer may be getting. And when we talk about external noises, we're talking about electrical noises, say coming from bilge pumps, aerator pumps, live well pumps, um, motors in the water like a trolling motor or something like that. It's to help filter out those noises. And it helps keep a nice clear screen. The next thing we're going to talk about is surface clarity. This is one of the most hotly contested ones depending on who you talk to. Surface clarity, this comes default set at low on the units. And basically what it does is it helps keep this top section of, the, of your screen. That's usually where you find a lot of clutter in your water, be it dissolved stuff, particulates, things like that. If you turn it off, you can see it's not real super cluttered here. We're on a really nice, clean, freshwater lake, so we don't see a lot of that stuff in here. And we're also seeing, I'm going to guess, where we're at. We're looking at hybrids on the screen. So there's a lot of hybrids in this lake. There's a lot of good hybrid fishing on this lake. So but your surface clarity goes in here and it helps clean. You can see right there where I made that slight change. You can see right here, it's a little bit thicker. Once I went to low, it kind of cleaned it up a little bit. If I go to medium, it's going to clean it up even a little bit more. You'll see how much on the screen, you know, you can see where it's cleared up here. This was no filter. This was low. This is medium. And now I go to high. As you can see, once I go to high, I virtually clear out everything in the top of the water column. Now when guys are using this, it, it's really a personal preference. It's what you want to look at. Um, you know, some guys really don't like using it. They want it off because they want to see everything that's in the top of that water column. The thing is, is it can get really cluttered up there, you know. There's a lot of stuff in the top of the water column. You go to medium, it kind of starts to filter it out. So I like using medium a lot of times because it filters out a lot of the particulate. It filters out a lot of little bitty fish that are up there. And then it helps me see just the bigger marks that are in that really top part of the water column. Now, a lot of times you're not actually going to be looking for the fish that are in the top of the water column like that. But certain times of the year, that's where you're going to look for them. So that's where you can do things like change your settings. You can clear out that water column. You can have more information in that top part of the water column. It really is just a personal preference as to what you like to look at. Um, a lot of guys, they look at the screen and they don't like seeing the information. And a lot of them refer to it as clutter at the top of the screen. Again, personal preference. So as far as your scroll speed, you typically don't have to change that. Basically, when you change your scroll speed, it just makes things speed across the screen quicker. A lot of times it's not necessary. Uh, guys doing stationary fishing, um, ice fishing guys have a tendency to increase their scroll speed and stuff like that. Ping speed comes default on these units at max, and that's where I leave it. Very seldom have I ever felt like I needed to change my ping speed. About the only time I've ever changed my ping speed, and I've only dropped it down like one or two bumps, is if I've been on the front of the boat and I'm drop shotting to fish, and I feel like I just can't see my drop shot rig very well. I drop my ping speed, you know, maybe one, maybe two, kind of depending. A lot of times that'll help me see my drop shot better. So. Again, personal preference, you know, just because somebody says, this is what I use, that's the best setting, that's what you should use, that's not always true. It's just going to depend on the type of water you're on, 
and the type of fishing that you're doing. So let's go ahead and go back here. We're just going to go to a full screen on this. And we're going to talk about more options. The cool thing about more options is the ability that it gives you to do certain things. So from this screen, you can do things like stop sonar. If I hit stop sonar, it stops the transducer from pinging in the water. Where I'm going to use this is, again, this is a perfect example on this boat. I've got multiple transducers on here running same frequencies. So if I hit stop frequency, it keeps me from getting interference from another transducer on the boat. So that's where I use that one a lot. Um, if I go from stop sonar, the next thing we can do is we look at the splits. Running right now on no splits, but you have different options for the splits. Uh, one we use a lot is a zoom split, and what this does, it gives you the ability to look at a particular part of the water column. So as you can see, we've zoomed in here. This little box, you can see the line from here to here. That basically shows us where we're zooming in. I can move it up to a different part of the water column. If I want to be zoomed in on the top part of my water column, I move my box up there like that. As you can see, now I'm just looking at the top 15 feet in the water column. So the zoom is really good. Like I said, if you're targeting fish in a specific depth, um, offshore guys use this a lot because they may be targeting fish that are in, say, 60 to 100 feet of water. So they want to keep looking in that 60 to 100 feet of the water column, but they also want to keep looking at the bottom, and they want to keep looking at the bottom because that's where they're looking for bait. So, uh, you know, offshore guys, where you find the bait, you find the fish. So if they can keep watching the bottom, the bottom area, looking for the bait that's in that area, and then you use your zoom splits to watch the water column that you're looking for the target fish in. So again, it's a really great feature and the fact that you can change it. So guys that are bottom fishing, uh, a lot of walleye guys, they bottom fish. That's where they look for walleye. That's where you see them. So this gives them the ability, like I'm doing here, we're zoomed in on the very bottom. So now I can look for those arches and peaks and, and things that are gonna represent to me a walleye being on the bottom while I can still watch the rest of the water column here. So again, zooms are really great. They're really useful. They have a little, give you a lot of ability to look at just different things. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a bottom lock. So. Hey Jacob, quick yeah. question you can hit on right there. Yeah. Uh, wanting to know how to change the value of that zoom range. Uh, okay, yeah, let's go back. That's real simple. So as you can see, right here at the bottom of the screen on my zoom side, right here it says we're zoomed in three times. If I hit the plus, I can zoom in four, five, six, so you can seven, so you can make that zoom deeper and deeper, you know, more focused on the section that you're wanting to look at. You know, there's, there's an eight time zoom, so I've gone in really close, I'm looking at this bottom right here, it's giving me a nice little small window at the bottom that I'm looking at to adjust it out. All I have to do is hit the minus sign. As I go out, you know, there's a two times zoom. There's no zoom. There's a two times, three times. So again, going back in gives you the ability to look at things and track things. Just find the bottom. Like I said, you can get in zoomed as close as you want to on it to look at that stuff or you can get back as far as you want to. So now when we go to the bottom lock, it's a lot like your zoom screen, except all it's doing is looking at the bottom. You don't adjust it, it's just looking at the bottom on one side, and then it shows you the rest of your water column that you're used to looking at on the other side. Again, this is one, the walleye guys, trolling type guys that are looking for something specific on the bottom, specific features. This is something that they're going to use to keep an eye on that bottom. So, like I said, it just depends on the type of fishing you do. 
uh, be it trolling, be it, you know, driving around looking for those walleye and dropping um, bottom bouncers or, or uh, jigs at them, trying to get those walleye to bite those. This gives you the ability to have a nice, you know, just looking at your bottom, have a lock on the bottom, have a zoom in on the bottom. And the other thing about the bottom lock screen when you look at it, if you look right here on the right side of the bottom lock, where the bottom is, it's a zero, one, two, three, four, five. So it counts up from the bottom. So what that gives you the ability to do, to look at it and go, all right, the fish that we're trying to target are, you know, three feet, five feet off the bottom. So guys with line counter reels, it's real easy. Drop that bait down to the bottom, bring it up however many feet you need to, to get it right in that strike zone. So that gives you the ability to target the fish, target them with the bait that you're dropping at them, gives you the ability just to kind of focus in on them with laser-like precision. So, and then the last thing that we look at here is flasher mode. So anybody that's uh, used one of our old green boxes, this is what we started on. This is, this is where we became who we are, was these flash, the flasher. Uh, a lot of ice fishing guys, they really like using this mode. They use flasher mode when they're out there on the water. Again, it's a little bit different. It's something that takes a little time to learn to read, but you start at zero, and as you go down here, you see, again, when we talked about the surface clutter, you see that right here in the top. The colors that you see here on the flasher basically match what you see on the screen. As we get out here further, you can see, let's see if we can find some fish to mark with in flasher mode. But as you start marking the fish in flasher mode, they'll start showing up at whatever depth you're in or whatever depth they're at. But as you can see right here, we're showing about seven feet of water. So it shows us our bottom right here. So your top's over here. And then as it spins around, you can see as we're getting back into deeper water, that bottom starts moving further and further around. We're gonna actually change out here. There we go. We have a little drop off. So as we move across here, let's see if we can uh, find some fish in here. Show you how they look on the flasher. As you can see, a lot of the stuff that you see in the water column, you know, you might have a little bit of bait fish and stuff like that in this water column here. They show up as these little spikes right in here, the little blue setting in here. So basically the blue you see on the screen over here becomes the blue you see over here. As we get into deeper water, it adjusts. I'm going to turn this way a little bit. Again, trying to see if we can find some more of those hybrids that we were seeing earlier out here. All right, right here, as you can see, when we went over that, we had a spike right here in the column. Let's see if we can find something else out here. So right here, the bottom right there, you saw it was a little spike right here. So that's basically how you read the flasher and what it's going to show to you. Like I said, a lot of ice fishing guys really like using flashers. So we'll go ahead and go back to, uh, to our main screen. So while we're looking at this screen, let's talk about A-Scope. A lot of guys are like, do I need to use A-Scope? Again, it's personal preference. The cool thing about the A-Scope is when you turn it on, it's almost like having a flasher on your screen. It's not a big round flasher, it's just a sidebar flasher. Guys like using this because as you can see, as we start coming over these fish and things, you'll see them, they see them on the flasher before they see them on the screen. So that gives them an idea of, of fish that are coming in. Uh, a lot of trolling guys use this because they're seeing it, the flasher, without it being an actual flasher, they see it like a flasher. They're used to reading those flashers. So it gives them the ability to look at that and go, okay, I'm, I'm gonna be targeting some fish, you know, we're trolling, you know, we got something here at 20 feet. So um, a scope is essentially just like I said, a flasher that's on the sidebar of your screen. So one of the cool things though, is you can use it and zoom in with it. So you can see we've zoomed in here. We've zoomed in again. So when we zoom, we're kind of looking at the bottom of the water column. You, you can move your zoom if you want to. You can just zoom from the screen instead of having a split screen. If you just want to zoom your screen in, again, for those of you who didn't see that, 
all we did is from this regular screen, if you hit a plus, you start to zoom in. Typically, it's going to track your bottom. All you have to do is touch this little bar, move it to where you want to look. If you want to zoom in a little bit further, just give it those bumps, move it around to look at what you want to see. Again, you're going to see a little bit of a representation here. You can see we're moving into deeper water. Move it down here to see the bottom. So if you ever look at a screen and it looks a little funky, and turn that A-scope off real quick. There's a lot of guys that say, my screen is just all fuzzy at the top, and there's a little sliver at the side that shows the bottom. If you look at it, the easiest way to tell you're in zoom is if you look down here at the bottom of the screen, right there it says 4X, so I know I'm zoomed in four times. Just hit back out, hit the negative sign, it kind of takes you back out, and it'll take you back to the regular screen that you've been looking at. So we talked about our split screens. So we're gonna look at another feature here. If you hit your pages button and you go to your sonar, and you just touch and hold your sonar, we have what's called our quick split screens. And I'm gonna go ahead and touch the sonar sonar. So if you've got a unit that's capable of doing dual channel sonar, like the HDS Live or your HDS Carbon, this gives you the ability to look at both of those transducers simultaneously. So as you can see, we have channel one and channel two. So when you're looking at a split screen like this, your menu bar is exclusively for whichever transducer channel has the orange box around it. These are both set up pretty much the same because I'm in the same type of water. But I could do something like change that to medium chirp. I change that to medium chirp, it gives me, again, that wider cone angle, a little bit of different look at the bottom, a little bit different look at the fish. So as you can see, even the returns look a little bit different. You can see your arches here that are kind of a smaller and compact when you get into the medium chirp, they look a little bit bigger and elongated. Again, that's because you've got that bigger, wider cone angle. So those fish are gonna stay in that cone angle for longer, looking bigger, looking longer. So a lot of guys, they like to use this. It just gives them the ability to get a better look at the fish they feel like, to decide if that's a fish they wanna target, if that's one of the species they wanna target. So again, went from medium chirp back to high chirp. Right here, you can see what my source is. This one says, this unit, channel two. If I look at that, you can see I have a couple other options. This unit, channel one. So if I wanted to say this unit, channel one. So I will tell you one thing that I always do if I'm gonna be swapping and not looking at two transducers simultaneously. So this one's on channel two. I'm gonna hit more options and I'm gonna say stop sonar. The reason I do that is to keep that sonar from pinging and creating any other interference for me. So now, another thing I can do with this one is now both of these are looking at transducer one. This gives you the ability, like we were talking about earlier, instead of zooming in, you can do your split screens here. You can see my orange box is around the right side of the screen. So I can go into this one and I can zoom in with this one. And let's say, so I've zoomed in. I've zoomed in five times on this one and I want to look, basically I know if I'm out here trolling whatever I'm targeting, I've been seeing them mostly in the four to five, four to six foot range. So I've zoomed this side in. We're going over a little shallow spot here. So let me move past this a little bit. Once we get across this, it'll be a little more obvious.
I should be hitting, yep. So I'm starting to hit the other side of the ledge here. You can see it's going to start dropping down really quickly. Already to about seven feet of water here. And there should be a ledge right in here where we take a nice big drop. There we go. So we went from about four feet of water into an 80 foot drop there. Now we're coming back up to the 60. So now if we look right here, we can see these fish that are at about 20 feet. So now I'm zoomed in. I'm in about that 20 to 40 foot range. So that gives me the ability to really focus in on that range and look at these fish. Again, this works for all types of fishing, be it freshwater, be it saltwater, offshore, um, deep freshwater in the Great Lakes. It gives you the ability to really get in there and just kind of fine tune, focus in on what you're looking for. So again, and then to get out of it, all you have to do is just hit your negative button to uh, take you back out. So another thing, again, we talked about stopping the sonar because of sonar interference. So let me go ahead and pop in here. I'm going to not have this sonar. I'm turning this one back on. So this is one of the transducers that's on my boat. It's an Airmar 175 high wide chirp transducer. It's a really amazing transducer. It's uh, very powerful. It's a one kilowatt transducer. So this is one of the transducers that we're going to use again when we do some type of saltwater fishing, um, getting offshore to where we can get down deeper in there. So as we look at this, you see these lines that have suddenly appeared here at the top that are kind of angled. Now look at this one. This is a really good example of interference. If you see this line, you see it goes top to bottom. You see we have everything just showing here in the bottom and everything, it just kind of looks funky and you're like, what is that? That is a classic example of transducer interference. As you can see, these little angled lines. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop the sonar again. I just stopped the sonar, you can see immediately. Let me go ahead and set it up here like this. So right here, you can see it says stop sonar. You can see it immediately cleared up when I stopped it. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the sonar back on. We're going to drive for a minute here. You can see where this sonar has come back on. So this is side by side. So this is where you're going to see the interference. It, you know, it doesn't always show up immediately, immediately. But after a while, things start to show up. So I will talk about the Airmar transducer a little bit here. As you can see, it's a one kilowatt transducer. You can see in here where we started to see this little bait cloud and stuff. Could be a thermocline in here, but you can see where it started to show up here and it didn't show up as much on this side on our regular transducer. Not that the regular transducer isn't a good transducer, but like I said, this Airmar is a one kilowatt transducer, so it's putting a thousand watts of power into the water. Here's that interference we were talking about. You can see it spiking up. You can see it spiking down. And again, now if you watch, still on this left console, I hit stop sonar. Immediately, that interference is gone. So if you see something kind of weird on the screen that you're not used to seeing, Nine times out of 10, it's going to be some type of interference. If you have two transducers in the water, a lot of guys that fish fresh water that they have a trolling motor in the water. If that trolling motor's in the water and that sonar's pinging and you've got your back, you know, either your shoot through hole or you've got a skimmer off the back or you've got a through hole transducer. And when I say through hole, this is, you know, the type of transducer a lot of our big water guys, coastal guys use. It's the transducers, a larger transducer. It's about a two to three inch hole that they cut in the boat. 
you put that transducer in and you seal everything up. So it's not like an everyday use type transducer. You want to use it on the proper type of boat. But like we're talking about, if you have two transducers and they're both pinging that same frequency, that's what's going to cause your interference. That's what's going to show up on the screen. That's what's going to cause, as you can see, we're stopped here. We get a nice, good, clean look here. I'm going to go ahead and pop over here. I'm going to stop the sonar on this side. I'm going to start the sonar back up on this side. As we look at it, again, you don't see that interference. You see a clean screen. You see these fish 30, 40 feet. So start seeing a, a thermocline down here. It looks like we got a little bit of a thermocline in here. Um, it's been really hot here lately. We've had a lot of sun. Uh, water temperature is almost 90 degrees here. So as you get into that lower, denser water, it's going to be denser, it's going to be cooler. So that's uh, what causes your thermoclines to show up on screen. So clear cursor. I'm going to go ahead and stop sonar on this one so that we don't get any interference. Go. Yep. And turn the sonar back on here. I'm going to turn us around a little bit so we can get some better light on the screen. Uh, unfortunately, like we said, with it being hot out here, again, beautiful weather, great lake weather, but that sun sure does uh, show up on the screen a lot. So let's go ahead and uh, we're going to drive this way a little bit. Does that look good on the screen for you? Perfect. So let's talk a little bit about some of our features. We talked about the A-scope. Uh, the other thing I'm going to talk about that guys don't use a whole lot, but they should. Um, let's put the source on this one, channel one. As you can see, we're getting a nice bottom here. Let me get this screen to fill up. So we have a feature called track back. And what this allows us to do is if I've driven over something and I think, man, what was it I just drove over? I want to see that. So it's called track back. Gives us the ability, touch my screen, slide it back. So if I want to go all the way back to this spot, say, man, I really like that spot. I can go back to that spot. I could drop a waypoint on that spot. You can see right there, the waypoint showed up on the screen. So if it's something I've gone over and I want to go back and look at it, it gives me the ability to scroll back and look at something. So another great thing about our track back feature that nobody else has is our stone sonar stays live while you do that. So as you can see, I scrolled back, scrolled way back here, looked at something, dropped a waypoint there, and then I hit clear cursor. And instead of losing everything that I've been driving over while I was scrolling backwards, we keep that sonar live so we continue. So while I was back here looking at something, let's say I missed this little ditch right here. That ditch looks like a good spot. You can see a lot of fish hang in these transitions. Let's put a waypoint on that. Waypoint right there. I hit clear cursor. As you can see, again, I did not lose anything. All the data that I had on my screen previously is still there. So that's one of the cool things about the trackback feature. It gives you the ability to do that. So something else that uh, a lot of guys like to do, I know we do this all the time because we like to do it. When we see something cool on the water and I want to share it with you guys, instead of grabbing my phone and trying to take a picture of my screen and getting the glare and everything from my screen on that picture, it doesn't always look good when you do that. So we have the ability with these units to take screenshots. Now by default, the easiest way to take a screenshot is press your power button and your pages key at the same time. So if I press these two, you can see screen capture tells me the screenshot. So that's how I know I took a screenshot. Now the other thing you can do is with your HDS lives, you have the programmable buttons. 
you wanted to program one of these buttons to capture a screenshot, you can. So you can either do it with a short press or a long press of one of these buttons. Now on my units personally, my pages key up at the top is a programmable button for long press. So what I've done is I just take that, I program that, a long press, you can see it takes the screenshot. So that's great, uh, you know, especially when you're using your side scan and your down scan, that's where a lot of guys see a lot of awesome, awesome features under the water. They're like, oh my God, I can't believe that was there. And if you take a screenshot, that gives you the ability to share it. You can share it with us. Again, that's something you can do. If you find a great screenshot that you want to take, you take that, you save it, you share it with us on our Facebook page, hashtag it, Anglers Unite. You know, it's just one of those things that you can do while you're out here on the water. It's fun, you know. We get out here on the water sometimes, and while we're always trying to catch fish, sometimes we have a little competition, not necessarily to see who can catch the biggest fish or the most fish, but sometimes we get out here and we get to playing around and we have competition to see which one of us can get the best screenshot. So, again, fun to do, it's great to share, you know, kind of helps you relive those things. So, matter of fact, I'm gonna show you a screenshot that I took just a little bit earlier today. We've been talking, you know, if you were on our last webinar, we talked a lot about chirp sonar over your regular sonar. How it sends out a burst of frequencies instead of one single frequency. So if you're on 200, it just sends out 200, 200, 200. And if you're on high chirp, it sends out a burst, you know, say 160, 161, all the way through the high end of that frequency. And we talk about it that it gives you greater clarity and greater target separation. So let's talk about target separation and screenshots. I took a screenshot, I hit the pages button, go back show you this again. Pages button, then I go to my storage. Um, if you have an older unit, it may be files. If you go to files, that's where they're gonna be stored. I go to my files and I go to screenshots. So it's got a folder that it saves them to. If you hit this little down button right here, it gives you the ability to copy all of them or delete all of them. And then when you go to the individual screenshot, when you go to open those up, if you touch it, it gives you the ability to copy it, set it as a wallpaper, rename it, whatever you wanna do. So let's see, yeah, here's the one I'm looking for. I hit view. Now, this, as you can see, this unit channel one, this unit channel two. So I had two different transducers pinging. We're going over the same spot. I had one in high chirp and I had one in 200. In 200, this just looks like one larger fish. But with high chirp, you can see that target separation. Instead of needing, you know, 13 inches or more of separation to show multiple fish, approximately three inches of separation lets you see multiple fish. And as you can see here, that's what it was. Well, that looks like one good fish. This looks like two pretty good fish. So, you know, again, when we talk about using chirp and why I'd want to use chirp over 200, that's just one of the reasons there. So, okay, Luke, do we have any questions out there? Yeah, I think one question that hasn't been answered yet is um, how far back can you track back? Okay, so on our trackback feature, how far back can we go? We can go full four pages. So as you can see, once we go back the four pages, you can see my slider bar at the top shows me where we're at. You can see I can't go back anymore. So I can go back four pages, and at that four pages, it's gonna start going ahead and keep scrolling. So if I wanted to mark this group of fish right here, I just have a short amount of time to do it. That's fine, so if I come back here, so I'm not in the four pages. You can see my slider bar up here that shows my history. I haven't passed it yet. When it gets all the way to the left side of the screen, it's gonna start scrolling again. But if I wanted to come back and mark this spot, come back there, hit save. Now, if I continued to sit here, eventually this screen would fill up. The slider would be all the way to the left, so I'd be past my four pages. So, but as you can see, now I hit clear cursor. Now, everything that I've driven over, again, like we talked about previously, I haven't lost any of that information. So, you know, that's just kind of 
It's a really cool feature. It's one I use a lot. Um, I know a lot of the guys I fish with use a lot. You know, you're out here, you're moving around. Let's say you're running. You're not necessarily on pad, but you're doing a fast idle through an area. You're just kind of scanning over stuff and you go, oh, what was that? I don't remember what I saw back there, but it looked pretty interesting. All right, I'm gonna scroll back and look at it. So, you know, again, just a really cool feature, a very handy feature, at least in my opinion. And I feel like a lot of guys think it's pretty handy also. So. Uh, yeah, one extra point there, Jacob, is whenever you pull up that cursor, it does show you how far back behind the uh, current position you are. Yep. That, that is a good point. Um, so let's talk about that. I just touched my screen. You can see where I touched the screen. Right here at the bottom, it gives me the depth, the water temp, and the coordinates, and it tells me how far away from that spot I am. So we can see I'm actually heading back that direction. So I'm getting closer to this spot if I clear cursor. Now if I scroll back, we can see here. So I've gone back far enough, so four pages is gonna give you about 12 tenths of a mile. So, um, you know, five, 600 feet. So essentially you can look at something about five to 600 feet behind you. So again, really cool, the fact that, and if you guys don't know that, if I look at a spot here and I touch that on the screen, it tells me how far it is from my current position. So it tells me that fish is now 50 feet behind me. Hit clear cursor, you can see it pops up there. So this is something you guys may or may not know about, but if I touch the screen and I put a cursor right here, you see right here on my screen it says measure. If I hit measure, I can start from my cursor. As you can see, I marked the length of that fish. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say that's a fish, but it shows, well, it's a fish, it's actually not as long as it's gonna show here. We use this mostly for measuring stuff on the bottom. I use it a lot of times if I was in a structure scan screen, that's where I use it the most, is it shows me that from point A to point B on my cursor is 11 feet. So let me finish measuring that. Let's just show you right here on a side scan. Clear cursor. Let me change this to a left right. So as you can see, we're looking left and right. If I see this spot right here and I want to measure that spot, it's 148 feet from my boat. If I hit measure, if I want to know how far it is from one end of that hard spot to the other, I can do that. You can see right here at the bottom of my screen, it says that hard spot. There we go, I've moved it over. I've measured it. It tells me that hard spot that I'm measuring, you can see it's, it's lit up brighter than the rest of the bottom, so it tells me that's probably a little hard spot over there. And it tells me that hard spot's 13 feet in length. I use this a lot of times if I'm looking at brush piles and stuff like that to get an idea of how big a brush pile is. Or again, if I touch it over here, it tells me that I'm looking 94 feet to my left. So it gives me the ability to see just how far something is from my boat or what size something is, be it a brush pile, a lay down or something like that that I'm looking at underwater. All right, and here we are again, back to these quick splits. Uh, Lucas, do we have any more questions? No, I think we've got some uh, audience members that are hungry to see a little side scanning explanation. Yep. We'll go ahead and uh, pop over here. Let's look at side scan. So my range right now is set to 100, I moved it out to 120 feet. Look right here. Look at this school of hybrids. I'm gonna say, the reason I definitely say they're hybrids is I fish this lake a lot. I know this is what the wolf pack of hybrids look like. So I can look in here, I can see that school of hybrids that was right there. So um, let's just kind of, I'm gonna speed up a little bit and kind of move over here a little bit, see if I can get over to the spot. I've got a great spot over here. There's a nice big brush pile. So, but as we're driving and we're looking at this, I'm gonna flip that out of the way. If you see these bright spots that show up on the screen over to the sides, you can see the difference over here. A lot of times, your harder spots, your rockier bottoms, 
they show up like that. The, the harder the return, the brighter it is on the screen. So as you can see, those, uh, those started getting in pretty bright. Um, actually over here on the left side of me, I'm passing a, uh, a rock wall. So you can see that it just starts to show up really bright here. You can see some of these rocks that are out here in the water. So looks like we got a bait ball showing up right here. Again, this looks like another school of hybrids that's right over here. But, you know, it's these things like this that show up that's just the most amazing thing when you look at them. So that's a couple things that we were looking at here. And, uh, you know, the funny thing about it is we get out here and we get to talking and we get to showing stuff and time just slips by. It looks like we've actually uh, run out of time for today's webinar. Uh, we appreciate you guys joining us out here. Uh, we appreciate all the questions that you guys have. Uh, don't forget, our Lawrence YouTube channel has a lot of instructional videos and quick tips there. If you guys have questions about your equipment and how it's running, or you're just trying to figure out something, go to that Lawrence YouTube channel. It's real easy. You can search um, by units, be it a TI, an HDS. You can look at that stuff. You can search that stuff, see if you can find the issue there or just tips and tricks, you know, how to use your equipment better. So don't forget to get out there on the water, send us those pictures, send us those screenshots, hashtag it, Anglers Unite, and stay tuned. We'll see you next month for another webinar.